Thank you very much. That was really showing love to us to be able to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Grace and mercy and peace are yours. They come from God our Father through our Savior Jesus. Amen. So today our focus is going to be on the gospel that we just read from John chapter 15. It feels like it should be something that is rather obvious. I mean, after you spend enough time together and you, you hang out, you share some laughs, you're, you're in line with your thinking and your interests, you, you don't mind hanging out together. It seems pretty obvious, but for me, there's always this awkward time where I'm having this mental wrestling match in my head. I'm asking the same question over and over again. Okay, are, are, are we friends? <laughs> it sounds silly, doesn't it? I, I should be able to know if I'm friends with somebody or not. Does anybody else have that kind of wrestling match in your head? You think I'm crazy, don't you? It might not be as silly as you first think. I think a lot of people actually wrestle with this to know if you're friends with someone or not. And the reason I know is because there are actually a ton of resources out there to let you know if you're friends with someone or not. And so I, I took a look at some of these this week, and a lot of them have the same themes, and I kind of boiled it down to five simple yes or no questions that I have up here. So how do we know if we're friends? You look at that other person, does that person listen to you or respect your boundaries or support you? Are they forgiving do they offer honest feedback? And so if you're able to answer yes to those questions, then you can stop being awkward. You can stop the mental wrestling. You're friends. So that helped me a lot for about a minute. Because then my mind started wrestling with something else. These kinds of definitions all have to do with the other person. What they do for me, and while that's great, that sounds pretty easy then to make a friend, to make it about somebody else, isn't it a two-way street friendship? So, so how do, what does this have to do with me then? And I guess this whole idea was bouncing around in my, my brain this week because of something Jesus says in these verses in John 15. You heard them before. I talked about it in the children's message too. Jesus says, you are my friends. And later on he says, I have called you friends. And I think it's really interesting the way Jesus says it. He doesn't come to us and say, say I'm your friend. He says, you are my friends. And that doesn't seem to fit any of those definitions that I saw in the resources. So it tells me that Jesus must have something to say about this whole friendship thing. And I think it helps to guide our goals for digging into these words from John 15. Two important questions pop up that we'd like to discuss. What is friendship with Jesus all about? And then once we are good with that, we have to answer, how does that friendship with Jesus then impact our relationship with each other? Do you think that Jesus went through that mental wrestling match in his mind before he said these words? He had every reason to, right? Who's he talking to? He's talking to, first of all, his 12 disciples, and then by extension, anybody who follows Jesus, you and me as well. So first of all, the 12 disciples, I don't know if they exhibited the characteristics of that friendship test. Especially when you consider the context, the timing of when Jesus said these words. Jesus said these words in the upper room the night before he laid down his life on the cross. And so you think about that night for the disciples. It wasn't their best moment. It was a night where they very clearly demonstrated they would much rather talk and share their ideas with Jesus than actually listen to his words. That's why they selfishly passed by the foot washing basin. That's why they um, didn't listen to Jesus when he said that they were going to betray or, or deny him. It was a night where they 
argued amongst themselves, who is the greatest? Kind of disrespecting that boundary where they were in the same place as the Son of God. It was a night where they didn't show a whole lot of support for Jesus. Every one of them, by the end of that night, would either deny, betray, or abandon Jesus. So you look at these guys and you think, these aren't the guys who you would expect Jesus to call friends. But if I'm being honest, when I look at that night and I hear Jesus' words, what strikes me is that I don't feel like I'm a whole lot different from them. Are are you? Don't get me wrong. All of us love the fact that Jesus calls us friends, but are we friendship material? Do we like to listen to Jesus? Well, we can answer that for ourselves. I mean, our, our own Bible study and Bible reading habits would answer that. The way that we handle hard teachings from Scripture would answer that. The, the way that we look at any of the commands of Jesus that might get in the way of our happiness. Do we like to listen? Do we like the fact that Jesus is a friend who gives us honest feedback. He confronts us with our sins. Are we always really supportive of our friend Jesus, especially when we get in those situations where it's not real convenient to admit that you're a follower of Jesus? I don't know. Truth is, we love Jesus when it's good for us, when we're getting something. But man, the emotion changes quickly when we don't get what we want. And so I think the bottom line is this, from the disciples then to to us today, our friendship with Jesus can be a lot like those resources. It can be a lot like our friendships in real life, but it is really, friendships in our our lives, um, it can be about us. And when it's about us, there isn't a whole lot to love, is there? And so that's why I asked, do you think that Jesus... Maybe he did some mental wrestling before he actually said these words, you are my friends. I don't think so. In fact, we don't get any inclination that he does, indication that he does, right? He just says, you are my friends. And the reason he could do that is because he was dealing with a completely different kind of love We we see this in the first verses, right? Just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. It's a just as kind of love. I think we experience this in our lives. It's kind of a pattern that that follows. Um, It's not always, but in general, what we experience and learn from our parents, we tend to live out and pass on to others. I can point to examples in me being a dad. I, my dad always listened to the band The Eagles, and so he passed that on to me. I love that, and then I made my kids listen to it, and they like it. We tolerate it sometimes. My dad brainwashed me into being a fan of all the Michigan sports teams, so I brainwashed my kids into being fans of Michigan sports teams. You see, it's a just as so I. But in a way bigger way, right? Jesus is doing this pattern. It's just as, so I. Just as the Father loved me, in that same way, I love you, he says. That's pretty amazing because you think about the love of the Father for Jesus. It's a complete love. It's a holy love. It's it's constant. It is a love that just emanates from the Father's heart because it's who he is. It's what he does. And Jesus experienced this from all eternity. It's, It's always. And we get glimpses of that. Remember at his baptism, the Father said, this is my son. At his transfiguration, he said, this is my son. I love him. I'm well pleased with him. Listen to him. And then the resurrection is the best proof of this love. The Father exalted him to the highest place, set him at his right hand, put all things under his feet. That's the way the Father loves Jesus. 
And now he says, in that same way, just as the Father loved me, that's the way I love you. Try to understand that. Thankfully, we get in a whole eternity to try to understand that. But maybe what we can understand is what it means for us. If Jesus loves us the way the Father loves him, that means that our lo- the, the Jesus' love for, is not dependent on us. It's not dependent on our behavior as though we can earn it or forfeit it. It's who he is. It's what he does. Jesus' love will never fail you, never let you down, because it is holy. Jesus' love isn't missing a little something here and a little something there, so you have to get other love. It's complete. It covers every need, every area of your life. Jesus' love doesn't go and then pause for a little bit, and then go again and then pause a little bit, because Jesus doesn't keep any record of wrongs. He forgives every wrong. How can we be sure? How do we know that it's a just as kind of love, the same kind of love that the Father gives him? Look what he says. He says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends, and you are my friends. There it is, that perfect love that he laid down his life. You never have to doubt Jesus' love or his friendship because it's all him. It's who he is. It's, it's what he did, laying down his life on the cross, taking his life back up from, from the grave. Jesus' love is a just-as kind of love. Just as the Father loved him, that same way he loves you. Aren't you glad that the resurrection is a reality? That's the point of this long series of sermons, right? It is reality, and it has an impact on our lives. This is what it means to have a living Savior. You have this kind of friend. And just, I want you to to think about that and ponder that when you're going through challenges and when you're sorrowful and you're sad and stressed and dealing with guilt. This is the kind of love you have. It's yours. But, <laughs> I still can't shake it. That, that question that I brought up at the beginning about friendship, this is great, but it can't just be the other person, right? What, what about me? After all, Jesus does say, you are my friends. And I guess the question as I, that I have is, how can we show friendship to Jesus when he loves us like that? Are you ready for that part? It's pretty fascinating, actually. It's not the answer you would expect, but it's, it ends up being pretty beautiful. Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. You are my friends, if you do what I command. And you look at that and you go, wait a minute. What? I thought this was unconditional. I thought Jesus just, it's who he is. He loves us. And now this looks like a condition. It reminds me of one of the craziest things that happened to, to one of my daughters. She was uh, in grade school. She was younger. And she had this classmate who actually said to her, I think multiple times, if you don't bring me a present tomorrow, I will never be your friend again. Isn't that what this kind of sounds like? Okay, I'll be your friend, but you got to do something for me. That's what it looks like. And man, if that's true, remember all that comfort we just received? It goes out the window because now it's replaced with fear. Maybe he's not my friend because I don't know if I can do this. I believe these two phrases of Jesus are complementary not contradictory. They both stand. He is our friend who loves us like the Father, and we are his friends if we obey, if we keep his commands. How can that be complementary? You start to see it when you understand really what it means to keep Jesus' 
commands. How do you understand keeping his commands? We have a way of using this kind of keep in our culture too. We think about a goalkeeper in hockey or in soccer. What, what does a goalkeeper do? They guard, they protect, they keep the goal, right? There's this sacred space on the field. There's this treasured space for your team that you don't want the other team to get past. So they guard it. They keep it as precious in a way. And if you think of keeping Jesus' commands that way, it just it, it opens up the beauty of keeping Jesus' commands because you are guarding and protecting something that is precious, something that is treasured to Jesus. So what does Jesus treasure that he wants protected? Well, think of the Ten Commandments. That's a good summary, right? Why does Jesus say, honor your father and mother? What is he protecting? Family. That's precious to him, right? Why does he say, uh, do not murder? What is he protecting? He's protecting human life that he created. Why does he say, do not commit adultery? What is he protecting? He's protecting marriage and your sexual purity. Why does he say, do not steal or don't even covet? He's protecting the gifts that he gives you, your possessions. Why does he say, don't commit or uh, give false testimony? He's protecting your good name, your reputation. So all of those things, he's protecting what? People. And you kind of put it together. Jesus guards and protects people because he loves people. And that's another definition of friendship that you come across all the time. How do you know you're friends with someone? You have the same interests. You like the same things. You love the same things. And so, if Jesus loves people and friendship is loving the same things, then we love people. And you start to understand then what it means to keep Jesus' commands. What does he say? My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Love the same things that I love, people, in the same way that I love. And so there it is, another just as statement, right? How do you love Jesus and keep his commands? You love what he loves. You love just as he loved you in the same way. If it wasn't so awkward, I would have you just pause and look at each other in the, around the room right now. And since it is awkward, I'm not going to have you do that, okay? But my point in doing that would be this. Maybe today, maybe for the next few weeks, I do want you to just pause and notice your brothers and sisters in Christ. This church family, other brothers and sisters in Christ. And then expand that a little bit. I want you to pause and think about, notice the family that God put you in, in your life. And then I want you to expand that a little bit and notice, think about the people that you walk by in the halls of your school or the, within the walls of your job. And then expand that infinitely. Think about every person that you come into contact with, even if you'll never see them again. I want you to think about and see people. And here's why. Whether it's here or the most random person on the street, are they all people that you're going to like and get along with? Are they all people that you're going to want to talk to all the time and hang out with? Some of them will be. But it's impossible. Not all of them will be. But you know what is true about every one of them? Jesus treasures them. And you love what Jesus loves. So you love the way that Jesus loved. Just as Jesus loved, you love them. Think about those people. Are they all people who are going to be nice to you and respect you? Are they all going to be people who do the things that are absolutely best for you? Some of them will. But it's impossible. Not all of them will. 
you enjoy Jesus' loving kindness and his forgiveness for all of your failures, right? That's why you show the same loving kindness and forgiveness to them. Just as Jesus loved you in the same way you love them. Notice all those people. Are, are they people that you would lay down your life for? That, that's a very few amount of people, right? If any, to be honest. And if we're being honest, there are very few times that God actually asks you to do that for someone, unless you're in the military, secret service, something like that. So how do we lay down our lives for others? We love time for ourselves, right? And we love the resources that we've stored up for ourselves. Can we lay those down to maybe listen to someone? Comfort them, encourage them, or just plain notice them. You see, the way that Jesus loves you, just as Jesus loves you, you love others. And this is a whole other sermon, but I'm going to give it one sentence. There's a reason for this. There's a reason why Jesus says over and over again, love each other, because after this love section... Look it up when you get home. What's the next verse? What does Jesus say? The world is going to hate you. They hated me and they're going to hate you. No wonder he wants us to love one another. We're going to go out in the world and experience a lot of unloving things. We do every day, whether it's for our faith or just because we're other humans. Don't let it be from us. Love one another just as Jesus loved us. That's the way that we love one another. So stop and take some time to look at people and look at people the way that Jesus looked at at his disciples, the way that he looks at you the night before he laid down his life for us. And in that way, you will be practicing a just as kind of love. Just as the Father loved Jesus, he loves us, and is just as Jesus loves us. We love one another. Amen. May that peace of God that passes all understanding guard to keep our hearts, our minds, through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.